not on yet. Oh, wait a minute. We are now on. Ladies and gentlemen, we will start in about five minutes. We're just waiting for everybody to take their seats, get comfortable, and we'll get going. You don't have to wear masks for this. We're in a secure environment. While we're waiting to get started, I'll remind people that if you want to submit a question, go ahead and hit the Q&A button at the bottom, and we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time that's allotted. We're going to, the goal is to quit exactly at nine, and I'm pretty strict about that. You should really have a screen that had the uh, has a picture of your book, but it was in the uh, the announcement. So people who read exactly. it, read that was great. The people in the audience now get to listen to all the banter that goes on before you actually open up the curtain and stuff. <laughs> so the truth is, we've got close. We've got a lot of people online now. So I think that um, I'm going to. Uh, launch in about one more. I'll give it another 60 seconds unless I'm told to wait longer, but I think uh, people have been, who've gotten online at the beginning should be rewarded for not having to wait. I see that we're live on Facebook, so I'll welcome all the people who are watching us on Facebook. All right, I think we're going to get this started. First of all, welcome to NGO Monitor's webinar, this in the form of a book launch. We're very honored today to have Adi Schwartz and Inat Wolf, the authors of a book whose title, at least subtitle, is going to take me at least three minutes to read. Each word is important. The War of Return, How Western Indulgence of the Palestinian Dream Has Obstructed the Path to Peace. The original was in Hebrew. And I have to say it was easy for me to run it in English. They're both very excellent books. The English translation, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read it yet, by Lon Levy is also first class. The book reads extremely well. And it's almost like a novel. You read it and you, you kind of know how it's going to end. And it doesn't end well. At least uh, your hope is, is a positive ending. But uh, the, as you see, the, the, all the issues develop and a focus on specific scenes. It's, I'll, I'll be careful and use this term, which I don't very often use. I'll say, I think this was brilliantly written. And uh, my students will say that I never, almost, I give you, I give a hundred, maybe once a year. And this is uh, one of those. So I'm, it was really, it was a pleasure to read it. It was also for me, uh, I have to say that the, the dedication to the memory of Robert Bernstein who died last year, and, and you, as you wrote, who dedicated his life to the pursuit of peace, justice, and human rights for all. I think that was very, very fitting. I'm gonna start by asking, I'll, I'll, I'll say a very brief introduction of who you are, but everybody has the bios and, and to do justice, I probably burn most of the time that we have. But uh, Einat, for most of you who may not, for those of you who may not know, served in the Israeli Knesset, and she has done a lot of, um, she, she's very visible in the Israeli political scene. She's done uh, advising to a number of people, some of whom are criticized in her own book, and uh, has really done a tremendous amount in terms of uh, educating, explaining, and uh, providing some very much background. Adi Schwartz has a shorter bio, but no, no less distinguished, uh, writing for Haaretz for a number of years and also that field. And I, I don't know how long to write this book, maybe you'll tell us, but the book itself is really a, a tremendous piece of work and a major contribution. Rather than trying to summarize the book, I think maybe the best thing I could do is ask both of you to say, spend a few minutes, not too long, because I have a lot of questions, 
spend a few minutes and tell us what brought you to write the book and what do you think that the major contribution is? Adi, you want to go first? Yes. Uh, so thank you, first of all, and uh, good evening. Thank you, Gerald, for NGO Monitor and for hosting us and for the very kind words uh, on the book. So I think uh, the starting point for both of us um, was the question of, of why there is no peace. Uh, for many years, we thought, uh, many people in Israel, and I think in the international community as well, that uh, there was a formula to achieve peace. Uh, it was known as the land for peace formula. And the expectation was that uh, Israel would cede territories that it captured in the 1967 war, and the Palestinians would establish their state. Um, they have their capital in East Jerusalem, have a state, end of story, end of conflict, happy ending, everybody's happy. The problem is that uh, each time the Palestinians were offered exactly that uh, formula, exactly that offer, they didn't say yes. It happened in 2000 in Camp David with Ehud Barak and later that year with the Clinton parameters. And then it happened again in 2008 with Ehud Olmert. And then I think both Einat and myself though separately started asking ourselves, so actually what do they want? What do the Palestinians want? For so many years and decades, we heard that all they want is a Palestinian state and all they want is the settlements to be dismantled, et cetera, et cetera. But then they decline and they don't say yes to even two, three, how many times should they be offered the same offer? And then I think that we both came to the conclusion, came to understand that Perhaps the conflict is about something else. Perhaps territory, while one of the aspects, is not the entire story. And we noticed that the issue of refugees plays a much bigger role than we expected for the Palestinians themselves. So the fact that Israelis or the peacemaking community, the international community, Europeans, Americans, didn't say much about the right of return and about the refugees was less important than the fact that the Palestinians were demanding that right. Now, for many years, we were told that this is only a bargaining chip, and this is something that the Palestinians know and understand, that it will never happen, all those explanations. But then again, for example, when Condoleezza Rice showed uh, Mahmoud Abbas the offer of uh, Prime Minister Omer, his first reaction was, what will I tell four million refugees? So not about borders, not about Jerusalem, again, the refugees. And that was the moment when I thought that a much deeper understanding should be devoted to the question of how is it at all that from a war that ended 72 years ago or 71 years ago, depending on when you count, how is it that there are still 5.5 million refugees demanding that they have a right of return, which they do not have, there is no such legal uh, uh, right to the Palestinian refugees. They are the only group on earth which are still refugees from the 40s. Their number is only growing. And we wanted to unpack uh, the history of this problem, uh, how it developed, of course, the role of UNRWA, the role of the Western countries, which supported and sustained this, uh, this uh, delusion that these people can return. And this is the reason why we call it how Western indulgence of that dream obstructed the path to peace. And the product of our research and of our uh, attempts to understand how it evolved is the book that uh, we're now discussing. Enat, do you want to add to that? Or can I, do I get to start asking my questions? I have 14 pages of notes, I have to tell Go you. ahead, go ahead. <laughs> There's a lot. I'll just say to the people who haven't had a chance to read the book, first of all, buy the book, read it. As I said, it's great reading. You've got five chapters plus an introduction or a forward and, and some conclusions. But I want to go through each one of the chapters a little bit, not at great length. We don't have the time. There, there are nuggets in each one of them. And I want to start with the issue of um, Bernadotte, of uh, Count Folk Bernadotte, the Swedish diplomat, back in 1949. read it, the original sin in introducing the idea of a Palestinian right of return was committed not by an Arab politician, but by Swedish Count Falk Bernadotte. I wonder if you can expand on that theme of, because the 
Um, this, the subtitle of the book is about how Westerners, uh, Western indulgence of the Palestinian dream has obstructed the path to peace. And Bernadotte seems to be one of the first one. You do mention others before, but Bernadotte has a very major role. So maybe you can explain that critical period when the concept of, of right of return or what the Palestinians call right of return started to uh, become very dominant for Palestinians and then the European Western indulgence. And then after that, I'll, we'll move on to West Westplaining, which is of course something that we have to talk about. D, you take Bernadotte, I'll take West Plaining. Okay. So, yes, you're right to mention that Bernadotte perhaps opened uh, a long series of Western involvement, uh, Western mediators and uh, third parties uh, who's, who are playing and are playing to this day uh, a very negative role in their uh, treatment of both sides. So let me just explain very quickly. Uh, Bernadotte was a mediator that was sent by the Security Council. Uh, it wasn't in 49, it was in 48, because by 49 he wasn't with us no more. He wasn't, um, uh, he was assassinated by Lehi in uh, September 1948. But while being here, he, in, in the region I mean, he was traveling between uh, the capitals, between Damascus and Cairo and Tel Aviv at that time. Uh, and we're trying, he was trying to achieve uh, a ceasefire, a peace agreement. And the only true document perhaps that we have is his diary. Now, uh, interestingly, he was not a Middle Eastern expert. He didn't know much about the history of the Middle East. And he writes in his diary, even before he arrives to the Middle East, that he thinks that the entire partition plan wasn't such a good idea. So he says it from the start. He says that because of the Arab rejection of the idea of the Jewish state, perhaps it wasn't such a good idea. So this is his starting point. And we will see that this is something that uh, uh, goes with him all the way. And, and the important point is, here is to understand that there is a much bigger emphasis on the Arab rejection. So Arab rejection is enough to push the Jewish state again and again. And then he puts for, uh, forth uh, the first ceasefire. I will not go into details because it's, uh, it's too long. Uh, the importance of Bernadotte to our issue is that contrary to any other standard, and you have to remember, this is the 40s, the end of the 40s, millions of people are refugees in Europe. Millions of refugees at that time exactly uh, we have in India, Pakistan, when the British Empire leaving uh, the subcontinent. So, the, the phenomenon of refugees is very common. Nobody speaks about return. There is no such thing. People move on with their life, usually resettle in the host countries. And Bernadotte, only here, is the first to mention in one of his proposals that the refugees should have the right of return. By the way, the resolution 194, which comes afterwards, does not mention a right of return. Bernadotte, as we say in the book, is responsible for the original sin. He coined the term uh, right of return. Our understanding is that Bernadotte was uh, working on the assumption of the West, that um, the Arab world was much more important. Uh, the Arab world had a political clout. We know that both the British and the American foreign ministries and State Department, et cetera, they were all against uh, establishing a Jewish state. And in that sense, uh, Bernadotte uh, operated on those same concerns and interests of the Western powers. And he was much more in favor of the uh, Arab um, interests and concerns than the Jewish ones. I think it's important to note that this was before we had UNRWA, it's before we had all these organization institutions. And that's one of the, the most important things I found got out of your book was you, you created, you provided, you didn't create, but you provided the background, which when you look back and you say, how did this happen 71, 72 years ago? Why are we stuck with this? You show us how the pieces were built one after another. And that, which brings me to the West Plain, because Bernadette, Swedish, European, coined the term. And constantly throughout the book, when we get to the other chapters, there'll be lots of illustrations, but it's the West that, that indulged. And that brings me to the, the, the term which I found really 
fascinating, the term West Flaming, and I'm going to leave that to Einat to uh, give us some information, background. And you'll have to look it up. Well, you'll have to yes, so West Flaming is a word I invented uh, based on mansplaining. Uh, mansplaining, of course, we all know what it means by now when men explain what a woman should think or try to say. And just as mansplaining basically established certain power relations and assumes that women are incapable of being agents of expressing their thoughts and what they want to say, uh, in the same way, Westplaining is the word I invented to say that Western diplomats and journalists uh, often treat Palestinians and Arabs in a kind of neo-colonial attitude, which refuses to actually listen to what they're saying and to accept that they are capable agents in history who know very well what they're fighting for. So what we're showing throughout the book is that Palestinians in particular, the Arab refugees, the Arab world are actually very clear about their intentions from the beginning. They reject partition, they believe that the Jews have absolutely no right to self-determination in any borders. Uh, they view 1948 merely as a battle lost rather than as a war lost. So uh, they, they're, the only uh, agreements they're willing to sign with Israel are ceasefire agreements because in their view, uh, they merely lost a battle, but the war is ongoing. Uh, they demand return and they build the idea of return not as some innocent humanitarian idea, some people think it is today, but from the beginning, it is deliberately built as the continuation of war by other means. And especially as the war by other means, uh, the war of military invasions essentially ends with 1973, the Arab armies check out of that option by 1973. The war of terrorism, while it continues ultimately is not able to achieve the ends. So the idea of return, the idea that millions of Palestinians will settle in Israel, in the state of Israel, in its pre-1967 ceasefire lines, in breach of Israel's sovereign will, uh, this idea of the right of return has remained, in many ways, the last vestige of the continuing war from 1948. So the Palestinians are very clear on it and the Arab world from the beginning. But the Western world continually West Plains it away, continuously what explains it away. And as you said, we have numerous examples in the book. My favorite is a recent one when the Palestinians of Gaza were nearly 80% of Gaza's Palestinian inhabitants are registered by UNRWA as refugees. So we have people who into the fifth generation are living in Gaza, their great grandparents have been living in Gaza, and yet they don't consider Gaza their home. Uh, because as far as they're concerned, it's a launching pad to take back from the river to the sea, their actual home. So they go on marches of return to the Israeli border with Gaza. They never march on the border with Egypt, right? And they call it the march of return. They're very clear, right? They don't call it the march for more electricity and better conditions in Gaza. They don't call it the march to uh, have greater access to goods in Gaza. They call it the march of return. And one of the examples, it's, I don't think it's in the book, but a New York Times journalist did a video piece and he's asking the people, what are they fighting for? What are these marches about? And they all say, Palestine from the river to the sea. We're going to take back our lands. A young person of 15 says, uh, I'm from village so-and-so. Now, he's clearly not from village so-and-so. The village doesn't exist anymore. It's inside the state of Israel. But he, um, a boy of 15, still views himself as having been born in that village. And he says, and I will go back there. The New York Times journalist completes the piece by saying the people in Gaza are fighting to improve the dire conditions. And for me, it's a beautiful example of West Plaining. They literally told you what they're fighting for. And you, West Plain, it away as something that has to do with economic conditions. 
I'm going to go back to the West Planning in a, at some point, but I want to now go back another stage in this process that you describe in a lot of detail and I think is very important. That is the rejection of alternatives, particularly the rejection of integration that took place that, that you really emphasized the period of the 50s for that. And, and the vignette that you have at the beginning at the end, vignette, but also extremely gruesome and tragic, I guess I'm giving away the plot, Musa Alami. And this, this focuses more on the Palestinians, the internal Palestinian aspect. And if you can talk a little bit about that, we're not giving them this, not a spoiler. Well, a little bit of spoiler alert, maybe. But it's, uh, I found that also something that, that's fascinating. And really, maybe you can tell if you agree or not, I see it as something that hasn't changed, a phenomenon that hasn't changed. Yes, uh, I totally agree. And just to sketch it out a little bit, so Musa Alami was one of the noblemen, you could say, of the Palestinian uh, society. Um, he was an Oxford-educated lawyer, uh, participated in the British Mandate administration, and even held discussions with Ben-Gurion in the 30s. So he was someone very famous, and in the 40s he participated in the attempt to convince the British to not uh, leave the mandate and to not uh, 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 make possible for a Jewish state. So this is someone who is very famous and nationalist, Palestinian nationalist. Right after the war, he writes a very famous article about how should the Palestinians uh, prepare themselves to the next war with Israel, right? So this is, this is the personality. But because he felt responsibility for his people, he decided that uh, all those people, and remember, in 1948, 49, you did really have people in tents and uh, in the cold, in the rain, so he really wanted to help them. And his idea was to create something of a, of a village uh, on the um, uh, Jordan River's valley, on the, both of them at that time were Jordanian, but on the western side, and um, to resettle, as you say, to reintegrate to bring their uh, families of farmers to be able to um, cultivate the land. You could say that this was a little bit of a kibbutz, of a, of a Jewish Zionist kibbutz, but that's just for the, compare, uh, just for the sake of understanding. Outside and, of the uh, Jericho area, as I recall, right? Sorry? Outside of the Jericho area. Yes, yes, it's, it's very close to Jericho. By the way, it exists till, till this day, in change the hands, etc. And uh, he succeeds, he finds water, and nobody wants to help him. The Jordanian king, nobody wants to help him, uh, not in financial aid, uh, etc. but he succeeds. And uh, the problem is uh, that from day one, uh, the most vocal opposition to his uh, project comes from the Palestinians themselves. So some of them indeed move there and enjoy uh, and uh, cultivate uh, fruits and vegetables and sell them to Saudi Arabia. But most of the people around him consider him, and again, this is a Palestinian nationalist, they consider him to be a Zionist, imperialist agent of the Americans and the Jews. And why? Because he resettles, he reintegrates people uh, and brings them back to life or to normal life. Why? Because for them, the only option was to return, this is what they started calling, to return to their homes, to the lands, to the villages. And for them, building a new house uh, was an act of betrayal, was a way to say that the war was over. Because if you look at the period of between 1948 and 1967, that was the only mm -hmm. grievance that the Palestinians and the Arab states could have against Israel. There was no other issue. There were no territories, no settlements, nothing. So only the refugees, that was the only issue that was very uh, clear that uh, the Arabs could, um, could attack and accuse Israel. So as you said, we will not, uh, um, we'll leave something to the book. So you don't know, we, don't, we won't tell the ending of the story, but you understood that he had a lot of opposition. And in that sense, uh, there's another important lesson that the Palestinian refugees are not pawns. They have agency over their lives. They decide they do not want to be resettled. And that's not the only uh, example. We found uh, surveys, polls being made already in 1952 by Ford Foundation in the camps. And most of them are simply not, they don't agree 
to go back to Israel under a Jewish state or under an Israeli flag. So the only way they can imagine uh, a solution is to unmake that injustice. So in their eyes, the creation of the state of Israel was an injustice. And the only way to find remedy to that problem is to undo the state of Israel. And therefore return is a synonym, is, is synonymous to uh, undo the state of Israel. They go back to the days before the creation of the state of Israel. And in that sense, as we say in the book, uh, it's not only a geographical return. So it's not only a spatial return, but also return in time, to the time before the state of Israel was created. And I agree totally that uh, since then, they refused each and every proposal. Uh, there were between 1967 and 1977, so in the decade after Israel captured the territories in the Six-Day War, there were 15 attempts by Israel, by Jews, to resettle them. None of them succeeded, and that was because of Palestinian opposition. We've uh, set the stage, created, understood the, the foundations, and now we have to talk about UNRWA. That's a theme that runs throughout the book, or at least from uh, 1949 on. It, when I read it, I was surprised, and I thought I knew a lot about UNRWA, that it was only had a one-year mandate at the beginning. If I, if I remember correctly. And there were a number of efforts over the years to shut it down. I think they were all led by Americans, if I remember correctly. And I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure whether you, maybe you mentioned at the end that the Trump uh, cutting off of funds, yeah, I think it's right at the end. But so that's another one. Uh, and uh, none of them have succeeded. UNRWA continues to march along, get stronger and stronger, reinforcing all the uh, Palestinian demands, mythologies, images, huge amounts of money, it's a huge industry. So I'm gonna jump to the question of recommendations. On, on the framework of UNRWA, and feel free to talk about anything you want to related to UNRWA, but what gives you any kind of optimism that after so many attempts have been made, or a number of attempts have been made to, to shut it off, and none of the Europeans have joined in on the, and that's what we see this time too. Trump cut off American money and Europeans rush in and, and increase their Germans, the Swiss and others. And they, they seem to relish doing it. So now that I've given you half of the answer, I'll ask you to talk some more about uh, some of the things that you, you found out about UNRWA and what, that, what the implications are for moving forward. So I'll start uh, with the end of what gives us optimism. What gives us, uh, let's say, long-term optimism that things could change, maybe not tomorrow, but over time, is that all other refugees in the world were treated differently. And as a result, they are now, and their grandchildren and great-grandchildren are, are enjoying good lives. And uh, throughout the book, we have uh, the case of the German refugees, the Korean refugees. We show how all of them were resettled. They did not return. And compare South Korea, compare Germany, and compare uh, their situation to that of the Palestinians. So our optimism comes from the fact that in cases where, pa where refugee demands to return, and many refugees wanted to return and turn back the clock, and uh, but in most cases, which is everything except the Palestinians, where these refugee demands were not indulged, ultimately people moved on. So we are able to draw optimism from the fact that Western indulgence is the key to why we're still stuck here. Now, why are we optimistic that it could change? Uh, in the 1950s, what we show is we describe it a bit, a bit in the book as a decade of arm wrestling between the two patrons of UNRWA, the Western funders, the US and the UK in the beginning, and the Arab countries that are hosting uh, the refugees. The Arab countries want the money of UNRWA, they want the money of the West, but they absolutely don't want the purpose of UNRWA, which is to resettle the refugees. They don't want the war to be over. Like I just said, this is the only remainder of the war. If they allow the refugees to settle, they recognize that the war is over and that Israel is, is here to stay. So they don't want that. And the Western countries want to resettle the refugees. And fairly quickly, they realize that there's no cooperation. Like Adi said, I think in the book, 
we show the book brings back respect to the Palestinians by actually taking them at their word, by showing that they are agents of history, they're not pawns. So the Western countries want to resettle them, uh, but they see that there's no cooperation, so they want to close down UNRWA. And in the book, we show how the Arab League, which at the time was powerful, was united, certainly united in its attitude towards Israel. Oil is very important for the reconstruction of Europe, for the West. There is real fear of a Soviet takeover of the Arab world. All of these things conspire so that when the Arab uh, League with the Saudis heading them at the time, come to the Americans and tell them, look guys, uh, you made one mistake in supporting partition. You really don't want to repeat that. Uh, so uh, from that moment on, the West basically caves in uh, and it becomes a racket. It becomes a paying of a regular annual bribe in order to keep the Arab world not angry. Uh, and that's what's, uh, and, and since that moment, UNRWA's mandate is renewed automatically, uh, just like uh, people pay uh, a bribe to, or a racket, you know, to the mob. They don't think about it. They have their store, they pay annually, and they don't ask questions anymore. Um, but now, you now the optimistic. So where's the optimistic part in so, this? Uh, so now we think conditions have changed. The Arab League is a shadow of its former self. Oil is not what it used to be. The Soviet Union is gone. Arab countries are beginning, certainly the ones in the Gulf, Saudi, are beginning to warm to Israel. They no longer have a need of the Palestinians as the sparehead of their battle against uh, Israel. So we believe the conditions are right for a change uh, so that the Western world can pull out of UNRWA, and again, they're more than welcome to support the Palestinians in other more constructive ways, but they can pull out without the price that they were threatened, that the price that they would have to pay as they were threatened in the 1950s. I think it's gonna be hard to convince Europeans of that. Arabs, very possibly, Gulf states, Saudis and others are doing this, but uh, Europeans may be the last. They may be more Palestinian in this sense than the Palestinians. I just want to say something to the audience. There are a lot of questions that have been asked. Some of them are very long. We can't read long questions while we're doing this. And I'm going to ask everybody to just ask one question, because otherwise it's, just, it's like that the pipe will get too uh, stuffed and nothing will move. So we will move to questions in a little while, but if we want to be able to read them, then you've got to uh, just pick one, put it out there, and, and make it short. Uh, there's something, one of the questions that I saw, and I think that's an important question to ask, is again, going back to whether it's West Planning, whether it's UNRWA, the role of the West, that they don't get it. But somebody asked, and I noticed that also when you were writing in parts of the book, the issue of anti-Semitism, supporting the Palestinian cause. Yes, on the one hand, it's condescending, they don't have uh, agency, but the, the one of the, I think it's John Davis that you talked about in 1959 was appointed professor of economics, was appointed as head of UNRWA. And I, I'm not sure that there aren't other places, but that struck me there at, when you use the term anti-Semitism. He was very fiercely anti-Zionist. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit, not only about his case, but also within some of the international institutional support for the Palestinian refugee cause whether there, where you see elements of anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism as part of that process, not just sympathy or humanitarianism for the Palestinians, but there shouldn't be, the Jews shouldn't have uh, self-determination. Who wants to take that one? Uh, I can start and if Inat has something to add. So let's just uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, Davis. He was the uh, head of UNRWA uh, from 1959. And uh, I think that Davis himself was both an anti-Zionist and an anti-Semite, and I'll explain why his case is very clear. Uh, he led UNRWA for a few years, and then when he left UNRWA, uh, he became one of the lobbyists, the biggest lobbyists of, of the Palestinians in Washington. So you, you see him raising money and writing letters to the New York Times and um, giving public speeches. And he said, he said very clearly, that the problem uh, in the Middle East is the existence of a Jewish state. He said that the moment uh, the Jews will uh, 
um, stop being Zionist or uh, go back to their natural place, then all problems will be solved. This is what he said. So this is clearly anti-Zionist. And regarding anti-Semitism, he clearly said, he said that the international, that the international Jewry, he accused the Jewish agency and the World Jewish Congress of their control of, uh, of uh, American media. So his case is very clear. He used all the classic tropes, all the classic anti-Semitic tropes. So uh, for him, it is, it is very clear. Um, as to more, in a more general way, I think that a few things blend here together to create this... Uh, perfect storm or uh, this uh, combination of real politic, and I'll explain in a second, uh, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. So real politics starts back in 1948. You have to remember that when discussions are being uh, held in, in the State Department and the famous uh, discussion between uh, President Truman and Secretary Marshall, and one of the aides say, we're going to help 600,000 Jews and abandon 60 million Arabs? How do you explain that? So you don't have to be an anti-Semite in order to say such a thing. If you look at the interests of the United States and certainly of Britain in, uh, after the war, uh, then as they not just said, the importance of oil, et cetera, et cetera. So they had their uh, uh, hard power, classic international relations interests. But then again, you see much more than that. Uh, if you look at the worst decisions that are being taken against Israel, uh, in the United Nations. This happens in the 70s. And this is orchestrated by the Soviet Union. Of course, it's culminated by the famous um, decision in 1975 of Zionism is, uh, is racism. And if you look at all the decisions, the worst decisions uh, who recognize the Palestinians and the right of return, this is the decade. So then it is clearly a combination of anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, all of it blended together. So I think it is a little bit complicated to differentiate between all those uh, elements. Just to finish my comment, I think that today there's another factor going in, and this is anti-Americanism. So mm -hmm. now we have a situation where if Donald Trump and the American administration is doing one thing, then almost automatically, Without thinking, the European Union will side to the other side. It doesn't matter. We, you can say whatever you want. Even if it's two plus two, then if Donald Trump says it's four, then they would say five. If he says five, then they would say four. So there's no way to discuss it. And I think the Europeans now see themselves as some kind of a custodians of the Palestinian cause. And uh, if Americans are pro-Israel, then they should be pro-Palestinian. So that's another factor going into the entire, uh, uh, entire scene. Uh, one of the, I, we're, we're sponsoring NGO monitors doing this webinar, and I'm going to ask an NGO question. I obviously I look for that when I read the book, among other things, and the, it comes up a couple of times. One is in 1999. I did not uh, get into the details until I read the book. The creation of a number of NGOs, and uh, Adil and, and El Alda are, are two of the ones that many of us recognize. That was at the end of the Oslo process, which is interesting, and. I'm not sure there was in preparation for the Camp David summit with Barack and Clinton and Arafat, but the issue of return again comes up there. And, and I think that that's also an important milestone because of the, the way you describe the Israeli perception, what, what people went into, and Einat, I don't know how much you want to talk about where you were involved, you were involved with some of the people there and, and what, what was going on there. But that, that's, I'll just finish on the NGO element and then go back to the broader question that the creation of these very visible NGOs, the very active NGOs, uh, that was the period of the growth of political NGOs. That's, that's when they went from these mom and pop type of amnesty writing postcards and, and Bob Bernstein running Human Rights Watch to Ken Roth and, and the Sharks running the NGO community. And it was very lucrative, but also very, very influential. And that was a way to get into the UN and the media. The other time that you mentioned is, and towards the end, when you talk about the fact that there are no op-eds, I'm reading no speeches, no NGOs in Palestinian society taking a position against the Palestinian ethos of return. A lot of the money for NGOs comes from European governments. Have you had any discussion with, have any European diplomats or officials responded, not just on the NGO element, which clearly they have no interest, all the NGOs are only putting pressure on Israel, but when you raise these issues with them of the, the whole centrality of, of the return ethos, 
And the fact that there are, there's no discussion whatsoever, almost no discussion, when there is, it's very much the exception that rules the rule, the Palestinian society about, well, maybe we need to change our policy on this. What, do, you, do Europeans engage on this at all? So the two things actually point to the same thing among the Palestinians. The ethos of return is the ethos of what it means to be a Palestinian. That is the very idea. It is in many ways their core identity. It is not a bargaining chip. Uh, it is not a negotiating card. And indeed, the worldview of the peacemaking community, including that in Israel throughout the 90s, was that this is a marginal issue, a bargaining chip to be bargained away at the critical moment for a state. Now, it is a legitimate worldview in the 90s. But after 2000 and 2008, when the Palestinians literally have the opportunity to bargain away that chip to have an independent state, but rather what they do is bar they bargain away the state so that they don't have to sign any agreement in which they say that they don't have a right of return, really shows you that it's not a bargaining chip, it is the thing itself which is why during the 90s, all these NGOs begin to be established. Because contrary to the myth, which again, we disproved throughout the book, that the Palestinians are pawns, that they are pawns by extreme leadership, uh, extreme Arab countries, we show that it's exactly the opposite. When the Palestinians begin to feel that their leaders, when they suspect that their leaders might be willing, in their view, to sell them out, they organize to make it very clear that they refuse for this to happen. So it's not that the leaders are extreme and the people are moderate. If anything, it's the opposite. But, it, but the leaders reflect the Palestinian ethos, which means they have very limited room to maneuver when they go to negotiate. And this is why they walk away from the Clinton parameters in, in 2008. And demonstrating this lack of room to maneuver is the fact that there are no dissenting voices, not an op-ed and not a meager NGO. In Israel, you have NGOs and op-eds from here to eternity, if you include the entire Jewish world. We have NGOs all the way going that support the Palestinian right of return. We have anti-Zionist NGOs uh, headed by Jews, even by Israelis. So we ran the gamut of debate and um, positions. And our question is, if the Palestinians are so moderate, if they understand it's a bargaining chip, where is the voice that will contest that? And for those who say, well, in, in Gaza and the West Bank, they can't speak up. So we say, look, Palestinians live in Sweden, in the UK, in Canada. Can they speak up there? Can someone please write an op-ed that will call on their people to move on? And indeed, when we present this to the European, I have to share with you one meeting with, we had really at the heart of it with a German diplomat who works in the EU in Brussels on the UNRWA funding. For an hour, a DNI expanded history. At the end of it, he asks, and it, it's at the pace that I'm doing it now. So you want to tell me that the reason that there's no peace is that the Palestinians still want all of it? And the DNI go, yes. And, Took you an hour. <laughs> but like and, and that was actually, but, but it's, it's, it even doesn't cross their mind that this is an issue. Uh, and then to even support a different voice uh, to, have, to help another Palestinian leadership debate emerge, it literally doesn't even cross their mind. And sometimes we hear what I find most infuriating. It's the only thing they have and, and we heard that from a EU ambassador and a DNI where we were not aware that this is your role to shore up Palestinian assets or so. It's West Bank. Yes. That's a perfect example. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
we have a number of questions. I'm going to move to questions. I'm going to take a few of them together. So those of you who've asked the questions, I hope you'll excuse me. Uh, but there are a number of questions that have to do with incitement in the UNRWA schools. And the, uh, you talk in, in the book about, you write about the map and a lot of other examples. The question is asked, why is it that we know we've known as Israelis or as Americans, or people have seen and written about this for many years. Why has it been almost impossible to change this, to, to change at least the content of what's being taught in the schools, what's put on the maps through international organizations like UNRWA? This is my favorite topic because one of the things I think we do well in the book is to be laser focused on what matters. And this doesn't matter. And the reason that this fundamentally doesn't matter, I mean, it's great to score points. People love looking at books and go, oh, really, that's what they're learning. But we always say, look, UNRWA is a Palestinian organization for Palestinians, run by Palestinians, uh, with a thin facade of Westerners because they are the ones who need to ask for the money. But it's a Palestinian organization. The Palestinian teachers are so-called refugees. They're the ones who enter the classroom. Now, it's a basic fact of all humankind that no parent and no people will ever educate their kids against their ethos. It's not going to happen. They have to change the ethos in order to educate their kids differently. So let's say, with great work, we are able to introduce into UNRWA the Israeli history books, okay? We get the most pro-Israel Zionist books into the UNRWA schools. Great achievement. What happens the next day? The Palestinian teachers who were born and raised on the ethos that they are uniquely victims of a great injustice, that their role in the world is to correct this grand injustice by fighting for return, even giving their lives to it. So this is their worldview and ethos. They entered into the classroom with these pro-Israel books. What are they gonna say? They're gonna say, dear kids, please close the books, put them back in your bags, and let me tell you about Palestine as it was before 1948 and what these damned Zionists did to it and why your role is to take it back. So the books, are a great way to kind of speak in Congress and to show that it's an issue. But one of the things we also show in the book is already in the 1960s, you have international commissions and Ted Kennedy concerned about the books. In the 60s, has anything happened? No, because if people will always educate their young to their ethos. So they will only change the education if they change the ethos. The reason that Saudi now has a TV series that begins to portray Jews positively is because Saudi in its own interest, because of Iran and the Arab Spring and whatever, decides that anti-Zionism is no longer necessarily a major issue for them. So our argument is that the Palestinian ethos needs to change and then the education follows but the ethos will only change under duress. No one changes their fundamental identity and ethos because they're convinced. It changes under duress. And the duress that needs to happen is that, that the Arab world and the Western world need to stop indulging and fueling these Palestinian ideas. And only when they look left and right and realize that they no longer have support for this, can we have different voices, NGOs, op-eds that can begin to shape a different ethos and identity and the education will follow? We're getting close to the end. I'm gonna ask one more question and give you both a chance to talk about anything we didn't get to. There are a number of questions that have to do with the Israeli, um, in, Israeli officialdom, largely inability to stay focused on these issues to, to uh, tackle them in a serious way. Uh, I've been, the, the, there was the anti-incitement committee that comes and goes periodically. There are periodic efforts. Maybe things are changing now. Uh, Joseph Shire asks about 
uh, does, has, he, this is my language, Joseph, in Toronto, not, not yours, but has, we say here, the asimon or the penny or whatever it is dropped among Israelis who, are deal, who have to deal with these issues. And I'm looking towards the new coalition government, some of the new, new people in there, I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic about, to some degree, some of them have a better understanding of how central this issue is. But maybe we can talk a little bit about not what was in the past or in Oslo and afterwards, but what's changed over time in terms of understanding how to put this issue further up on the, on the set of priorities. And not just in, in the right, but also I think, uh, I don't know how to define uh, Benny Gantz and Kahol Levan, but let's say that this, the more centrist part of Israeli society in terms of our Israeli leadership, in terms of dealing consistently and, and, um, and, and somewhat more efficiently in terms of putting these issues uh, very much on the front of any kind of talk about peace and going forward with, uh, with, with a different political uh, development that's not unilateral. So let me tell you, I'll start with a story and I think you'll understand the rest. Um, so last year, Einat and me, we had a series of meetings with uh, several European uh, diplomats, both here, ambassadors, and in uh, European capitals, uh, in Berlin, in Brussels. And um, I'll give you, it happened with a German official, and then later with the Swedish ambassador. We are sitting in the office and explaining for long minutes why uh, it's a very bad idea to continue and sustain uh, UNRWA and why if they are really supportive of the peace and the two-state solution and all their, um, you know, uh, official policies, then they must tell the Palestinians that there is no right of return, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then at one moment, they come to us with the question, so why is it that the IDF actually asks us to keep the money running to UNRWA? And this happened again and again and again. And we know for a fact that after uh, President Trump uh, stopped the funding to UNRWA, then uh, Israeli uh, officials went to European countries such as Germany and told them, please fill in for the missing money. So this is not only, you, you asked something like, uh, how should we raise the awareness? It's much worse. It's the fact is that, uh, and there are a few uh, reasons, I'll give you one of them, is that I think that for too long, uh, the Israeli policy has been mainly uh, uh, constructed and, uh, and decided by people in the army. And this is very normal if you look at a, at a general or even uh, you know, a lower ranking uh, uh, officer, he wants quiet. He doesn't want uh, people in Ramallah or in Janine or in Nablus to rise up and start a new intifada. So all he cares about, and I'm, I'm respectful, I'm not saying that in, a, in any disrespectful way, he wants quiet. That's what every uh, military officer wants. And then he says, okay, now we have UNRWA, uh, we have schools, we have clinics, then simply go on with it. And all kinds of new initiatives such as uh, dismantling UNRWA, changing the landscape, and I'll say a minute something about how to dismantle UNRWA, then the army was always very negative towards the idea, and, um, and it managed to decide, it managed to whisper uh, on the ears of the prime minister and to say, listen, if you are going to stop the funding to UNRWA, we're going to have violence. I'll, I'll tell you <laughs> perhaps another story. We were sitting with an Israeli official and explaining why Israel should seize the moment of the Trump administration and explain the, the, uh, you know, the unnecessary role of UNRWA, the destructive role of UNRWA. And he answered back, do you mean before the holidays or after the holidays? So Israel is known as the Achrei Chagim or Lifnei Chagim. So there's a lack of long, long, you know, uh, uh, long-term thinking and the understanding that perhaps for a military officer, junior officer, he wants to control his you know, space or his uh, neighborhood. But we're talking about something who, uh, which reflects the future. Now, the children who are learning in this UNRWA, every baby that is born now in the territories is automatically considered a refugee. This is detrimental. Now we have five million refugees. We have six, seven, eight, and nine. This, will, this is a never-ending story. 
So when we talk about dismantling UNRWA, what we basically suggest is a differentiation between the services. If the Americans, Europeans, Germans want to sustain the schools and the clinics, so kids will not, you know, have nothing to do, roam the streets. So keep on funding the, the clinics and the, and the hospitals and, and the schools. But stop with the political issue. These people are not refugees. Those who are in the West Bank and Gaza, certainly not. Those in Jordan, certainly not. So you have to differentiate between the political. There is no right of return. And therefore, we don't see a serious problem if you dismantle UNRWA in that way. That was really, in a nutshell, but to explain why we think we do have the correct way, uh, and even the army should not be so worried about uh, uh, such bad developments. And now I'll give you almost the last word. We've got a few more minutes. If there are issues that you So, uh, unfortunately, uh, really what you have is a D, myself, and a few other people, some of them who we call latent cells inside uh, Israeli ministries, uh, who are focused on this issue. But we, this, is, this is an uphill battle because of the military establishment, which I can tell you as a member of Knesset who picked it up, I was, uh, I was actually charged by people in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Defense of inciting a third intifada, that it's on me because if we dare raise this issue. And this is really the idea of long-term versus short-term. This book is about long-term peacemaking. Maybe I'll end with the story of Willy Brandt because this is our source of optimism. 12 million Germans are brutally, brutally expelled after Germany surrenders. They're not Nazis. They're expelled from uh, Poland, from Western Poland, from Czechoslovakia, from other countries. They want to return. In that sense, they're no different from the Palestinians. They want their homes back. They want to turn back the clock. Do, does anyone indulge them in that? Of course not because the world at the time is clear that if Germans take back Poland, then it's World War III. So they're not indulged in that. And it takes a while, they have lobbies and they have organizations. And Willy Brandt as an opposition le leader is sympathetic to their cause. But in 1970, he signs an agreement with Poland to basically say that Western Germany no longer claims uh, that part of Poland and that the border is final. And he gives a speech to his people and to the German refugees in particular. And we say in the book, just do a cut and paste of Willy Brandt's speech to a Palestinian leader and we have peace. Because he tells his people, it's over. Those lands were gambled a long time ago and not by us. And what I'm saying is not surrender, but it's common sense. And we must look to the future rather than focus on the past all the things that a Palestinian leader needs to tell his people so that they can finally have the constructive future that Germans have today. And it took 25 years, and we were even shocked to discover that after German unification, Helmut Kohl tried to push return, and of course, America put the kibosh on it. I mean, who's gonna have return in 1990? So, we want the West and the international community to take the same attitude that they took with the German refugees and all other refugees in the world with the Palestinians. And then perhaps in 25 years, if we're lucky sooner, a Palestinian Willy Brandt will emerge who will finally tell his people it's over, we're going to move on, and then we can really have peace. And this is the thing about our book. We're laser focused on what matters for peacemaking, on what the key obstacles are, but it's a long-term strategy. It's not gonna buy you peace tomorrow morning, but it will finally set us on the course to peace. For, nine, for 70 years, we have not been even coming close. Our ship, the ship has been sailing further and further away, funded by Western money and political indulgence. So we want to turn back the ship so that it can at least set course in the direction of peace, 
so that we can have peace sooner rather than later. I often disappoint my very right-wing friends by saying that this is still a book of peacemakers. This is a book of people who still at the end of the day believe that the Jews are going nowhere and the Arabs are going nowhere and that we have to find a way to live side by side as separate political entities. But we realize that to even have a chance of getting there, the main obstacle that needs to be removed is this Western indulgence that allowed this Palestinian return to multiply and inflate into the insanity that it is today. I was almost going to say on this happy note, but you add the extra <laughs> sentence about the insanity that it is today. But on this almost happy note or optimistic note, I'm going to thank both Enat and Adi for joining us for a fascinating discussion. Our time is up and you can, we can do this for hours. So I'm going to, you can read it in English, you can read it in Hebrew. I'm waiting to see when the German edition is going to come out. And <laughs> the languages, but I think it's, it's a very, very important, it's the book that had to be written. So I want to thank everybody for joining in. I apologize to people who raised questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. There are also a couple of them with some suggestions. Mail and I uh, can forward them if they're uh, ones addressed to, the, to our guests. And we look forward to further NGO Monitor webinars and to further discussions about the future of the Palestinian-Israeli uh, dialogue, put it this way, uh, these very <laughs> critical issues. So thanks for the contribution. Thanks for joining Thank us you. tonight. And Thank everybody. you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye.